My name is Benjamin. I'm with Teach Me to Dive. I'm a technical dive instructor. I live here in Idaho, and I've got the absolute privilege and honor of uh, sitting and interviewing today with Dan Orr of Dan Orr Consulting. We all know Dan. He's fantastic and one of the most knowledgeable souls in the dive industry, at least in my opinion, when it comes to safety and uh, how diving works. Dan, thank you so much for taking the oh, time with us. My I pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I actually began diving uh, many, many years ago. I was certified in 1964, uh, actually in Ohio. Uh, and then after that, uh, spent a number of years in the military. And then after the military, I became a uh, scuba instructor. Uh, started a diving program in Ohio at a place called Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, uh, which actually turned out to be the largest college-level program in the country at the time. Uh, worked there for 15 years and then moved to Florida State University, where I was the associate dive safety officer and instructional coordinator, uh, developing all of their training programs, both the research and recreational. And then after a few years there, went to uh, Divers Alert Network uh, in Durham, North Carolina. I went there actually to start uh, their training programs. Uh, and then over the years, I actually worked my way up and uh, retired as president of the organization in 2013, moved to uh, the great state of Idaho, uh, living in Driggs right now and doing consulting work for the global diving industry. Quite a career. So you, yeah. I didn't realize you were in the military. I was in the military. Spent what, uh, 10 years altogether in the U.S. Navy. Okay, yeah. there we go. So what yeah. did you do in the Navy? Well, a number of things. Uh, I spent uh, a tour of duty in uh, Southeast Asia uh, in 1968, uh, then came back. Uh, and then after, after some time uh, on active duty, I went into the reserve program. Uh, during my time in the reserve program, I became a certified Navy diver and did uh, diving activities uh, assigned to various places, for example, like uh, the Navy Coastal Systems Laboratory in Panama City and uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, a few other places, uh, as well as spending time on uh, various ships of, of different types. Wow. So what was your starting job? What did you start out in the Navy as? Uh, well, I was actually uh, a bosun mate. Okay. Uh, so I was an enlisted man. Uh, I remained an enlisted man uh, during the time that I was in both the active duty and, and the reserve program. And uh, my job, I had a number of different things in uh, Southeast Asia. I was part of a gun crew. I was also part of an uh, uh, air crew rescue team where we would go into the water if necessary to pick up pilots that had to punch out of an aircraft uh, or had to uh, have some other difficulty in crash landing in the water. Uh, or, and also pick up things that were out there. We picked up um, drones and a number of other things. So we uh, were keeping pretty busy. And then uh, once, I, once I got into the reserve program, uh, I, I definitely wanted to be a diver anyway, but at the time there weren't many uh, billets available in the diving programs there. So I actually started a diving program for the Navy Reserve Center in Ohio, uh, where we taught people how to scuba dive, uh, hopefully preparing them or eventually getting involved in diving in the Navy in some way. And so we, uh, we actually worked with the U.S. Air Force because they had a pool uh, that we used, and we got uh, equipment donated from local dive stores, uh, did a program, and then we would send these people out to their training duty uh, period during the year, and then uh, they could uh, get involved in some diving-related activities. And uh, so it was, it was a good time, but... After 10 years uh, of doing that, uh, I decided that I wanted to do other things. So, uh, so I uh, got out of the Navy and then uh, continued uh, working at various universities around the country. Oh, well, thank you for your service. No, and thank you for your service. Thank yeah. you. That's, in that's interesting. So you got involved in diving in 1964. At that point, it was a pretty small community. Yeah, actually, the first time I experienced anything related to scuba diving was uh, really even earlier than that. It was in the late 1950s uh, because I uh, grew up in southern Florida in Miami. My grandparents owned a home in the Florida Keys and Plantation Key, and a good friend of theirs was a guy named Art McKee, and Art McKee was the first treasure hunter in the Florida Keys. And I can remember going to parties my grandparents had uh, where Art McKee would be there, and he would be talking about the treasure he would find. He'd be wearing treasure around his neck. And, and uh, that was always exciting to me. And when I would go down to the Florida Keys to spend time with my grandparents and go out snorkeling, just about everything I saw in my mind had to be part of a Spanish galleon. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 19, about 1955 or so, uh, my parents took me to a drive-in theater. And I can remember, actually, I was 
not even in the car. I went down to the front uh, where they had the play sets and everything, and I'm mm -hmm. laying on the grass and looking up at this gigantic uh, screen in this outdoor theater, and the movie was Underwater, which starred uh, Richard Egan, Gilbert Rowland, and Jane Russell. And uh, most of the movie, in fact, I think over 75% of the movie, was actually filmed underwater. And they found a Spanish galleon. And so I remember laying there in the grass, looking at this like a poor man's IMAX, um, <laughs> looking at this, and I said to myself, that's what I want to do. And so after that, I really was trying to find ways of being able to get involved in scuba diving in some way. And I was really too young to get certified at that time. But a friend of mine, his brother, had some diving equipment. And so we were able to put the equipment together and, and at least breathe underwater a couple mm -hmm. of times. I don't really call that scuba diving, but we were able to breathe underwater. And then um, I, I've actually moved my grandparents down to Costa Rica for a number of months. And then my parents and my grandparents all moved to Ohio. And then I finally convinced my parents to let me get involved in a scuba course. So uh, in 1964, my brother and I both took a uh, scuba course uh, in Dayton, Ohio. That's amazing. And, and I've looked at, and surely that's before my time, but <laughs> <laughs> I, before a lot of people's time. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And I, and I find that my, as I progress my diving career that I, I get to tell that to my children as well as that's before your time as well. So, you know, certainly age creeps up on us all and, and uh, uh, time and tide wait for no man. Yeah, that's true. But I've, I remember growing up watching the Jacques Cousteau and, oh, yeah. and I still yeah. like going back and revisiting the Jacques Cousteau. The gear has changed so much. Yeah, it has. And uh, even back in those days, I mean, even back in the 50s, they not only had the double hose regulators, but they also had single hose regulators. And and then uh, I can remember even in 1964, I mean, we were not using buoyancy devices of any kind. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not using pressure gauges. Uh, they hadn't been invented yet. Uh, we were using uh, J-valves on the scuba cylinder where you pull down, and that gives you a certain amount of additional air. Uh, and before that, it was just when you, it was hard to breathe, it was time to come up. <laughs> and, and so there were, a lot of, there were a lot of safety improvements that took place, a number of those things. Uh, were taking place as I was doing training because I became a, an instructor in 1972. And I can remember the introduction of different types of buoyancy devices because um, back in those early years, uh, we were using something that almost like a May West that they used in World War II, uh, had a CO2 cartridge. And it was really didn't provide you with any buoyancy compensation. It was simply a safety device. Uh, and then over the years, they became larger, they became a little bit more sophisticated. They had a way to actually inflate them without having to blow uh, into them. You actually had an inflator valve that you were able to use to inflate the buoyancy compensating devices. There were a number of different ones out there. And so every time one new innovation like that would come out uh, in the training program I had, we would test it all. We would test it all to make sure that it worked even in the worst case scenario, which really has been kind of the cornerstone of what I've been doing my entire career, and that is to look at everything from kind of a skeptical point of view to make sure that everything works in the worst case scenario. Um, and, and safety, of course, has been what I've been involved in for my entire career. And the same thing happened with pressure gauges, same thing happened with dive computers. Uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in the development of the first electronic dive computer called the Edge. And uh, I was actually running an instructor training program at, at Rice State University in Dayton. And this instructor training program involved a number of people from around the country and a few people from around the world. There was a guy there named Carl Huggins, uh, who was from the University of Michigan, and another guy named Craig Barshinger, who was from France. And Craig had this idea about an electronic dive computer. And one really did not exist at that time. And so in the evening, we would sit around and we would talk about this idea that they had about this electronic dive computer. And so during uh, the instructor course, we kept talking about it, and then we agreed to meet after that. We all met in Toronto, talked about it in even more detail. And then um, they came up with a prototype, and they called me one night in my office, and Betty was there, and we were uh, talking about it. And they said, you know, we got this prototype, but we don't know what to call it. And so I said, well, you know, it's uh, electronic. It should be a guide to your diving. So electronic dive guide, E-D-G-E, -E, edge. That's where the term edge came from. And so we worked for them for a while. I worked with them for a while. Um, and uh, that, of course, then led to other dive computers. And uh, now dive computers are an essential part of diving equipment. So, so it's, um, it, it's been an interesting time. <laughs> that is for sure.
Absolutely. So at about that same time, this, uh, Scripps in, in California, the Navy were also developing. Um, how did their research and, and their development at that time influence your de decisions and, and your development? Well, um, I actually did some contract work for the U.S. Navy. There was a guy in Ohio, his name was Paul Webb, and Paul Webb was an expert in thermal properties of diving equipment. Uh, he was trying to develop uh, a, a new suit that the Navy had to keep divers warm even in the coldest water because uh, not only was the Navy doing dives in very comfortable temperate waters, but also in the polar regions. And um, when I went to... Uh, Panama City to work for the Navy Coastal System Laboratory as part of my training duty with the U.S. Navy, uh, I met Paul Webb and we talked. And one thing he was talking about was that they were developing new pieces of equipment. At the time, the U.S. Navy had had a, a non-compressible wetsuit because one of the problems they were worried about at the time was that you can have a wetsuit and the wetsuit will keep you relatively warm, but as you go deeper and deeper, it does compress somewhat, mm -hmm. which reduces the thermal property. So the Navy had this non-compressible wetsuit that wouldn't be affected by pressure change or depth. And I, I never had a chance to dive with it, but I did get a chance to wear it once. And it was two very thin layers of neoprene. Um, and in between was silicone oil and glass beads. And the jacket alone probably weighed 30 pounds. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it, was, it was extremely heavy. And it, it was too bulky. You couldn't really move around with it on, and it, it just it just didn't work. So then they, the Navy had this idea about having uh, using a dry suit. Uh, and so um, Paul Webb, the guy that I had met in Panama City, had a lab in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And so he called me one day when I was back in Ohio, and he said, you know, I'd like you to test dive some equipment that we've developed. And what they had developed was a crushed neoprene dry suit uh, and a Thinsulate undergarment that you wore. So um, we went to a, a local quarry and I was contracted to test dive this equipment. And I had to test dive this dry suit uh, when it flooded and also when it was dry on the inside. And it had to be in water that was 40 degrees or colder. So I had to dive below the thermocline, th thermocline with the dry suit open and the suit flooded with this thermal undergarment to give my impression of, of how the Thinsulate really kept you warm. <laughs> well, it didn't. <laughs> and the Thinsulate um, was a good idea. In fact, they, they actually ended up developing more Thinsulate undergarments. But the, the one that I had um, really didn't have Thinsulate all over you. It actually had Thinsulate panels with flexible material in between that gave no insulating properties at all. So even though I loved the dry suit, and the dry suit worked really well, you couldn't swim with it because it was a, it was a dry suit that the the uh, deep sea Navy divers were using because it had work boots, it had panels and the leg that contained lead to keep you feet down uh, so you wouldn't actually turn upside down. Uh, and it was back entry zipper, which was revolutionary at the time. Uh, and uh, the dry suit itself was fantastic, but diving it wet, <laughs> the thermal undergarment that didn't really work very well was, <laughs> was a little bit challenging. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah. I think a lot of people take for granted how quickly water will yeah. cause hypothermia. Oh, yeah. Well, then when I went to, when I worked at Florida State, we also had a relationship with the, at the time, uh, again, the Naval Coastal Systems Laboratory in Panama City, and they were doing a lot of research and development. And at the time, uh, we went over and talked to them, and they were developing helmets for uh, special operations divers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the helmets would allow them to be streamlined uh, when they exited the submarine, sometimes through a torpedo tube. Um, and they also had a curved faceplate, which was really the first curved faceplate in scuba diving. Because having a curved faceplate doesn't really work very well optically. And so they were developing a curved faceplate that could work properly. And so we went over and had an opportunity to talk to them and, and get some advice from them because at the time at Florida State, we were very, very heavily involved in science diving and, and, for, and doing a lot of of the very early cave exploration, we weren't really exploring as much as we were supporting different departments at Florida State University. That's definitely a good place to, to get into cave diving, that's for sure. It was, it was, and uh, cave diving, uh, at the time I was, uh, when I went down there, I was really not interested in cave diving, but part of being the Associate Dive Safety Officer and Instructional Coordinator, I, I had to do that, um, which was probably one of the more challenging things that I had to do, but uh, the cave training was, was probably some of the best training I'd ever had. Um, 
partly because you, you learn a lot more about buoyancy control than you do in standard scuba training program, because you have to. Uh, and then it was sort of emotionally challenging because there were a lot of places that we went to that were uh, very difficult to get into. Uh, they had major restrictions um, where you literally had to do almost like a Lamaze caving where you had to uh, work your way in, wiggle your way in, exhale as much as you can, wiggle a little further, inhale as much as you can, exhale as much as you can, wiggle a little further until you finally were able to get into the open part of the cave system. Uh, and that was all done uh, for research purposes uh, that were supporting different departments, for example, like the hydrology department at Florida State or the archaeology department or any of the other departments that needed some sort of assistance. What year was this? I was there from 1988 to 1991. So I was there for three years altogether, and um, and then I was recruited to go to to Dan uh, in North Carolina. So at that point, BCs were really starting to come into a new dynamic. Sidemount hadn't been really come along yet at this point, so the equipment was still fairly bulky and, and not traditionally <laughs> efficient. Yeah, it was very bulky and sometimes very very rudimentary because uh, prior to doing that, I'd I'd actually never used wings before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can remember that the first set of wings that I had uh, were homemade wings that were made by a guy named Steve Girard, who worked for us uh, at Florida State. And, and Steve was a very prominent cave diver. And so I can remember removing the cloth bag from around the, the wings and seeing a car inner tube as the inflatable part of the, of the, of the wings, which didn't give me a whole lot of confidence, believe me. <laughs> Um, and, and then we, they, we weren't doing, they didn't have side mount, but we did occasionally carry an 80 with us because we were using uh, double 104s, which are extremely heavy mm -hmm. uh, and extremely bulky. Uh, and then we'd occasionally carry an 80 under an arm. Um, and then we'd occasionally have drop tanks at various places, depending upon the length of dive we were doing. Uh, and then we were, we were doing a lot of other things at the time. We were doing a lot of stuff with nitrox. In a couple of different ways. Um, one way from a scientific standpoint was to increase our bottom time. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the work that we were doing in the Gulf of Mexico was in relatively shallow water. And because of that, we wanted as much bottom time as we could, so we were using various nitrox mixes. I was actually using nitrox for another reason, uh, because part of what we had to do was to provide training to science divers. So somebody who was a certified diver didn't necessarily get automatic entrance into our science program. So we had to make sure that they were competent enough to really be able to do the kind of work that they were doing underwater. So I would have my staff go out into the Gulf and um, do training dives and uh, observation dives with some of these people to make sure that they were qualified to be able to do the science work. Well, they were doing um, a lot of ascents and descents with these people in water where the depth was generally no deeper than about 60 feet. So what I was using nitrox for at the time, which I'm certainly recommending now to people uh, to be conservative, is to use it with air dive tables. We weren't using computers necessarily back in those days very often, but using a nitrox mix with the limits uh, in, in, uh, that were required for using air tables, which actually gave them a safety factor. Um, so nitrox was a big thing that we were doing. Plus also, we had projects that were a little bit deeper um, down in the southern part of Florida. And one was at a place called Warm Mineral Springs in Venice. And Warm Mineral Springs was a very unique place because it was a place where ancient seawater was being pumped up near its crust. So it was temperatures where the, um, the temperature never went below 84 degrees. And the water was heavily mineralized. So during the night, um, the water was very clear, but as soon as it interacted with sunlight the next morning, uh, at least the first 15 to 20 feet turned to opaque. Uh, and then at, a, a, at 50 feet was a ledge that we think 10,000 years ago was uh, a human habitation site. We actually found human remains at 50 feet on this ledge uh, because we think the water level was, 10, was 50 feet shallower 10,000 years ago. Um, and then we found a burial site, we found a kill site, we found a saber-toothed cat skeleton, we found uh, some, a giant Florida bear skeleton on this ledge. Uh, and then at the bottom was a cone of sediment that had been accumulating for at least as long as that spring had been open, which we think was at least 10,000 years. So we, had, we were supporting an archaeologist who was 
looking at that cone of sediment. Um, and, and it was 124 feet to the tip of the cone of sediment and about 170 feet to the base of that cone of sediment. So because of the work that he was doing, the archaeologist, we were, and we were supporting him from the surface because we were using surface blind gas, uh, we were using Trimix. And so we were doing stuff with Trimix earlier than most other places were using uh, mixed gas. Wow. And what we were, did, that was 1988 and 89. Wow, Trimix in the 80s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that was revolutionary. Uh, it, 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 was, it was very early. And, um, and it was, I mean, we were learning a lot, and we were getting as much advice as we could from the authorities that were available, like Bill Hamilton, for example, uh, and some information from the U.S. Navy and from anybody else who had experience in using mixed gases. That's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the things we do now in, are the things that you've learned and, and added to that point, and I didn't realize it had gone quite that far back. And it's, I feel like still, even with Trimix, we're still in a great learning phase of understanding the true effects and overall dynamic of what that is. And even with it as widespread as it is, I still feel like there's so much more research that needs to be done and, and really needs to understand of how the, the metabolic and the physiology work with the human body. Yeah, in fact, actually, uh, you know, you, I mentioned that I had worked at Divers Alert Network, and that's actually where Trimix was created. Um, because in 1981, Dan started in 1980, uh, and in 1981, uh, the person who was the president of Dan, Dr. Peter Bennett, was involved in a deep diving research project called the Atlantis Project. And the Atlantis Project involved uh, divers living uh, and working at a depth of down to 2,250 feet. So they were in the chamber complex at Duke University Medical Center, which is a massive complex at eight chambers, uh, one of which could go down that, to that depth. And during their dives uh, to reach 2,250 feet, uh, they were getting to extreme depths, like over 1,000, and at that point, Divers were getting tremors, uh, which is high pressure nervous syndrome. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't figure out exactly why that was happening, nor could they figure out exactly what to do, do about it. But they knew it wasn't going to be compatible with uh, doing a safe dive. So during that Atlantis project, uh, Dr. Bennett said, well, why don't we add a little bit of nitrogen back into the heliox or helium and oxygen mixture they were using? And by adding that little bit of nitrogen into that mix, the tremors went away. And so that's how Trimix was created. It's amazing, and that, yeah. that's one of the things I, I read that study, and, and it is amazing to add a little bit of nitrogen back for the narcotic effect, so you utilize the narcotic effect to our advantage to calm the diver and to reduce the, the high-pressure yeah. syndrome. Yeah, was, that was, that's absolutely amazing. It was amazing. I mean, it was a, a very interesting project, and they did finally reach 2,250 feet, uh, and uh, they learned a lot, a lot. In fact, they actually even had some issues with decompression sickness during the ascent back to the surface, and I think they did have some DCS issues as deep as 1,000 feet. And no one had ever experienced that before, nor had they ever seen that before. And so they had to learn how to deal with those things as they went along. And all that became part of the body of knowledge in deep diving. It's amazing. And to, to learn, and, and oh my goodness, we're at 1,000 feet with DCS. Oh yeah. no, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you don't want to hear that when you're the diver on the inside of the No, chamber. I can't imagine for a second. I mean, you, you read about some of the issues that go down, you know, when uh, they were exploring the Marianas Trench and, and uh, they talked about the cracking of the window and, and realizing that, wait a minute, we're, you know, five miles down and the window's cracking. Yeah. We yeah. can't just do an immediate ascent. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, a friend of ours who unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, not in diving. He actually had a medical issue, but... He was uh, one of the guys that worked with uh, James Cameron uh, when they filmed uh, the, the Titanic, and they were going to use part of that for the Titanic movie. So uh, this friend of ours, his name was Ralph White, and Ralph was the pilot of the submarines that were going down to the Titanic wreck to be able to do uh, photography and videography. And, and he used to make sure that he told the people who were doing the videos inside the submarine uh, that don't worry about the crackling sounds you hear and the, and the groans and the noise you hear during the descent because that's simply part of it when you're getting under that much pressure. He said, the thing to worry about is water. So if you feel water, then that's, that's it. And so he always used to keep a squirt gun with him <laughs> during, the, during the descent. You know, these guys are all worried, and he would give them a little squirt. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I'd want that to happen while I'm down there. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Ralph was a great guy.
but I think that's that's a common thread that I've noticed in, among a lot of great divers is that there's a sense of humor. I mean, you, I don't think some of this. Well, you certainly need to take the science and the safety with absolute. Uh, this is we need to be safe, but you also have to have a sense, certain sense of you humor do. as really well. Do. Yeah, and I'm, it's good to see that. And, I, and the best instructors that I've worked with um, and learned from and or worked with um, over the years have been the ones that had a sense of humor that they didn't take life too seriously. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a good thing, and I would like to have been there for that. I think I would have been the guy oh, who's yeah. working on it, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I heard a song this morning, and the, the lyric was, is, I could see myself doing that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so shift gears just a little bit. Uh, who was your inspiration starting out in diving? Who was that person that inspired you to go as far as you've gone? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, part of it was the people that I saw in the movie Underwater, uh, and then seeing other people, for example, like Lloyd Bridges, uh, who influenced a lot of people in my, my age group. Um, and, and I think those people kind of led me to be more interested in, in scuba diving, but there were, there were some people. In fact, the, uh, the first instructor that I worked with, not the first instructor that I had, but the first instructor that I worked with, a guy named Bill Kesson, was uh, really a very, very nice guy. Um, and everybody enjoyed being around him. He was very personable. He really was very knowledgeable about the sport. He was dedicated to the sport. And I think that was an inspiration for me because I thought, uh, you know, he's a, he was a good role model. And that's the kind of person I wanted to be like. And then I met other people. And I can remember that when uh, Betty and I started going to various dive shows and dive conventions, when I really wanted to get more actively involved in the diving industry, we used to see a lot of these people. We used to see the uh, Jack McKinney's, we used to see the Stan Waterman's, we used to see the Cousteau's, uh, and uh, the Rick Frazee's, a number of people who uh, were very prominent in the diving world at the time, and and some of them were really, really good people, and they they, they sort of brought you into their circle, uh, and, and they were inspirations. In fact, Stan Waterman still is an inspiration for a lot of us, and he actually turns 100 uh, coming up next month. Uh, and I had an opportunity to dive with him uh, when he was doing his 90th birthday tour. Um, some people, like celebrities, for example, they generally don't have a one-day birthday. Their birthday spreads throughout the year. <laughs> and Stan was the same way. He was going all over the diving world and had a chance to do some, actually, great white shark cage diving in Guadalupe with him. Um, and we still communicate with him uh, on a regular basis, but he's going to be 100 here coming up here shortly. But um, you meet a lot of people, and you meet a lot of people who who do show you good things. There are some people that show you the way you don't want to be necessarily, but, uh, and I think the thing to do is to pick up those good things, uh, the things that make you a better person. And I've, I've tried to do that. Fantastic. And it's interesting that, yeah, so um, you, you were diving at that time when Jacques Cousteau was, he was his show. I remember the, the Calypso. Yeah. And I, I, I lived for the, the Sunday night show when, Jacques Cousteau, uh, Undersea Kingdom came on and, and watched that. It was that was a time in our home, at least, um, that nobody's talk. Commercial, it's time to get the popcorn. <laughs> go to the bathroom. There was no TiVo to, or anything to that, to that nature, but that was yeah. a big time in our house, and that's something that definitely inspired me growing up as well. So, But you met Jacques Cousteau. I did. Uh, I did at uh, Beneath the Sea, the dive show at Beneath the Sea, and uh, and he was a nice guy. I mean, he was uh, very personable. Um, he wanted to talk about diving, of course, and I've had an opportunity to meet the other Cousteau family members. And uh, in fact, a number of years ago, I was uh, actually the moderator for a panel discussion with all the members of the Cousteau family. And, uh, and other people, for example, like uh, Lloyd Bridges, I had an opportunity to meet, meet him, uh, and uh, Sylvia Earle. And so being involved in diving and getting involved in some of the organizations that I'm involved in, I have an opportunity to meet a lot of these people. And, and you really find out that uh, they're good people. Uh, they're very good people. And you find out, too, that the, the real active part of the diving community is a relatively small group of folks mm -hmm. uh, who travel around and do a lot of things for uh, various conventions and TV programs and that kind of stuff. And, and so it's, uh, it's been an opportunity to really interact with all these folks. I think the blessing is, and the, almost the curse, the, the joke in the industry is that how do you tell a dive instructor? You wait two minutes and they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and tell you things you don't want to hear necessarily. Fair enough. And, <laughs> and you know, we all and I think all of us should probably have our little uh, uh, scuba swear jar that every uh, every time we uh, are 
talk about scuba that we weren't asked, we have to put a quarter in, <laughs> we'd be rich, right? But that is true. The, uh, the true. diving community is wonderful that way, and it's been my experience in, you know, going to DEMA and, and going to different shops that when you talk to the people behind the counter, you talk to the owners, it can turn into a two-hour conversation. My wife has just about put a ban on, uh, or at least a <laughs> limit when we travel, how many dive shops I'm allowed to go into and talk at, because we know if we go into the dive shop and the owner's there, we're going to be there for two hours talking oh, yeah. about their sites, talking about them, <laughs> talking about the industry. And we enjoy it thoroughly. And it's, it's not been my experience in other industries that, you know, for example, a mechanic doesn't talk about shop. A cobbler doesn't talk about fixing shoes and uh, as much as, as a dive instructor talks about the undersea world. Because oh, yeah. I, yeah. I feel strongly we're in an amazing, beautiful environment that um, it's almost like being astronauts to a degree. Yeah, it uh, is. Yeah. That we get the opportunity to explore something other people don't get to see. And people want to know about those things. They want to hear about it. And, and I have, I'm, I'm very fortunate because as when, when we decided to retire from Divers Alert Network, because Betty worked there also, uh, she was the Vice President of Insurance Services there. Um, but we started getting involved, more involved in volunteering, more involved in uh, working with various nonprofit organizations. So, uh, for example, right now I'm the Chairman of the Board of DEMA, the Dive Trade Association. Uh, I'm the president of the Academy of Underwater Arts and Sciences that gives out the Nogi Award every year, which is kind of like the Academy Award of Scuba Diving. Uh, I work with Force Blue. I'm the chairman of their board uh, and uh, Best Publishing Company and WCH Media. I'm the chairman of their board. So through all of and other things, I'm on other boards as well. But through doing that, you get a chance to meet some of these people and you get an opportunity to, to hear the stories because those stories are very important. Those stories are really the history of our sport. They're really the legacy of, of our sport, and very rarely are they memorialized anywhere. And I was a president of the Historical Diving Society for a while, and, and they've tried over time to, to be able to continue to get information about those people who were those early movers and shakers in the diving industry, uh, as well as recording somehow the experiences that they had that shaped the industry the way it is now. And the industry... Uh, is continually evolving and becoming uh, safer, becoming better, becoming more enjoyable uh, in spite of the challenges that it faces um, because of economics and because of the, the potential for a degrading environment. Um, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a tough time, even though it's always a, also a good time because we're looking forward into the future. Absolutely. So you have a different perspective on the industry becoming from Dan.org and, and the safety and the consulting you do on the safety side of it, um, understanding, studying the accidents. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I read your, your accident reports and your studies and, and uh, watch a lot of your lectures, and I'm, I'm just enthralled with the safety aspect of it. But it's a, it's a portion that a lot of dive instructors or sti dive students don't see and don't, um, don't look at as close as they probably should. So as a dive instructor, um, what things would you look for to make sure that you're, you're dealing with a good dive instructor from your vantage point? Well, in interesting. When I, uh, when I decided to become a, a scuba instructor, and, I, and I, to be honest, I didn't actually ever intend to be a scuba instructor uh, because I worked as a pool assistant for a guy who owned a dive store in Ohio. And my best friend and I were in the pool one evening waiting for him to, to show up. And he used to, uh, where he worked at a factory actually during the day and then taught scuba at night. Um, and when he came home from the factory that evening, he had a heart attack and died. So we were waiting in the pool with all these students, and he never showed up. His wife finally came and explained what happened. And, and so after we got through the, the trauma of the whole thing, she came to me and said, uh, you know, I've got all these students, uh, this dive story. She said, she said, I need to have somebody teach them. Do you want to be a scuba instructor? And I said, well, you know, I'm I'm in a, a biology program. Uh, you know, I, my intention is to be a biologist. Uh, I, don't, I just don't know. And she said, well, I'll pay your way. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll go. So, uh, so she sent myself and my best friend to uh, a scuba instructor program, actually, with the YMCA scuba program down in Cincinnati. So I became a scuba instructor. And then once I did, uh, the first time I got in front of a scuba class, and I, I realized that, hey, you know, I like this. And I think I can... I can make a difference. And what I decided to do at that point is to find out as much as I could about the sport, as much as I could about diving in all kinds of conditions, because I felt if I was going to have the responsibility of teaching somebody and giving them a certification card that said that they were certified and qualified to dive, I needed to teach them everything. I needed to make sure 
that at the end of that course, they were so good, they were so qualified, that I would have them die with the person I loved the most uh, and not have any qualms about it. And so when I finally started teaching, that's how I approached teaching. And I had the luxury back in those early years, because that was in 1972, I had the luxury of having standards as a guideline. So you, could, you couldn't go below the standards, of course, but you could go as far beyond as you wanted. So the way I approached things was to look at it from the, from the student's perspective. What did that student need to know and be able to do to be safe without me having to be there? And, and so I tried everything, did as much as I possibly could for a number of years, and I made sure that I never taught anything that I did not have expertise in. And I think that's also what I would recommend to any scuba instructor, is make sure you are never teaching anything unless you have expertise in it. Um, and so when I then started teaching the courses, uh, my courses were different than what other people were teaching because I generally, and I had the luxury of teaching after a while in a college where I had more time. Uh, and even when I taught uh, in, for a dive store, I still insisted that I would have more time uh, to be able to do the things I wanted to do. And so not only would we teach those standards that were in place at the time, but we would then create our own exercises to be able to make sure the students were completely competent. Because one of the things that I always thought about was that, at least from reading the accident reports, and this was long before Divers Alert Network was in existence, I was re reading accident reports from the University of Rhode Island. There was a guy named John, Ma John McAniff who collected data on diving fatalities and published it. So I got a hold of all of those, read them all, uh, to figure out what, was the, what were the triggering issues that triggered a dive to become an injury or fatality. So one of those was the stress of having a mask on. So I would never, ever, ever, ever allow a student to take a mask off in a class session, a pool session, ever. They couldn't take the mask. The mask had to stay on their face. I wanted to be completely comfortable with a mask on their face. Um, and there was also issues where people, once the mask flooded, they would panic. So I can't tell you how many exercises we did where uh, the student had to do things with their mask flooded. We were doing exercises where they had to do the exercise with their mask full of water um, to make sure that Water was no issue, or do exercise with no mask on. So every exercise we ever did, students did it a number of times with no mask on. Um, and so we ended up developing all of our own techniques and training procedures. And then after that, I felt I had a real tr problem with transition of going from an entry level diver to an advanced diver. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily feel that there was enough experience involved to get into an advanced class. So we actually developed a class in between the open water and advanced class. And that was what we called experienced open water diver that involved 25 open water dives before you ever get into an advanced class. Um, and because we wanted people to have more and more experience because in reality, the certification card was irrelevant. It was the training and experience and skill of, and the ability that really was important. And in fact, for a long time, I wasn't necessarily even interested in giving out certification cards other than open water because nobody would ever ask you for a certification card that wasn't open water. I've never in my entire diving career ever been asked to show an advanced certification card <laughs> because they don't want that. They don't need it. Um, and when you go in places, resorts, for example, what they want you to know is they want to make sure you're certified, uh, and then you go from there. Um, so I had an opportunity to really develop a lot of things um, that really made me more comfortable. But again, advice I would give to any scuba instructor is make sure you are extremely qualified in everything that you teach and make sure you're thinking about making sure the student is fully prepared for the environment where they're going to have their first open water experience. Because we taught in Ohio, and in Ohio, visibility is relatively poor most of the time. Uh, you have thermoclines where even in the summertime, the water could be in the low 40s below the thermocline. And probably the most hated piece of equipment ever invented was the wetsuit hood uh, because people hated them. And I've even seen people do under ice dives with no hood on because they just didn't want to wear a hood. So we even had students wearing hoods in the pool to make sure that when they had their first open water experience, there was no stress involved from wearing a piece of equipment they'd never worn before. And that way they could focus on what they really are there to do, and that is to transition to open water and have an enjoyable experience. So after the open water dive, they can't wait to come back and dive again. Fantastic. So what's one thing you learned in your open water class that you haven't forgotten to this day? Well, let me, let me first of all tell you about my open water class. Um, 
This was in 1964. Mm -hmm. uh, the instructor was a guy named Ray Tussey, who was now a number seven. And the course I took with my brother was really not much of a course. Um, we had uh, a lot of uh, exercises where we were taking equipment off and putting it back on. Uh, underwater, we were treading water, holding the scuba tank up. And these were steel scuba tanks at the time. <laughs> um, so it was mainly survival rather than real learning. And, um, and in fact, when I, during the course, they kept talking about, well, we have the pool session, we have the lecture session, and then we have open water dives. And in Ohio, there weren't many places to do open water dives. So we were talking about this place, Dale Hollow, Kentucky, which is a reservoir. And so we kept thinking about that and talking about that during the summer. So uh, at the end of the course, um, I took my written exam, which again was not very much at all, um, and as I handed my exam to the instructor, uh, with the other hand, he handed me my certification card. And I kind of looked at him and I said, well, why are you handing me my certification card? Don't we have these dives we're going to do at Dale Hollow or some place somewhere? And he said, oh, go check yourselves out. Uh, so I really did not have any open water dives during the course. So I don't remember a lot about the course itself, other than the fact that there, there wasn't really much to it, uh, which is unfortunate, um, other than the fact that we learned how to survive underwater. And I had, there was not much academics. I, I don't remember ever hearing the term air embolism during the class. I don't remember anything about the bends, other than I had this impression that only Navy divers got it, because that's all he talked about, because he was telling sea stories most of the time. Uh, so I didn't really learn a lot about the course, other than the fact that I learned that I needed to know more, that there had to be a better way. There had to be other things that there were to learn. Um, and then when we did open water dives, I had moved to Ohio from Florida, where the water was relatively warm most of the time. Never wore a wetsuit, because wetsuits were hard to get anyway back in those days. And I can remember going out to a quarry after the course was over to check ourselves out. and. Um, I think I was wearing a t-shirt and jeans or something, and, and got down to about 20 feet, hit a thermocline, which I had no clue what it was, uh, and the water temperature dropped from the 70s to the 40s, and I thought I was going to freeze to death down there. So, so we survived those early dives, and then uh, I, my brother and I at least had the, the smarts to be able to learn more, and learn more not only through more diving, uh, but also reading everything we could. I mean, we got Skin Diver Magazine. We looked at whatever books were available, because there wasn't much that we were exposed to in those early years. So I didn't learn a lot from that course other than the fact that I needed to learn more. <laughs> Survived open water yeah. training. So that, that would be I the did. memory, is how to, how to survive open water yeah. training. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I think that helped shape the things I was doing in the future, because I, I realized that, that you need to be comfortable when you're in the open water. And, and there's nothing worse than getting out there and not really being fully prepared for it. Uh, because it doesn't really encourage you to want to go on. Luckily, it did me, uh, but other people in that class uh, were not encouraged at all, and I don't think those other people did any more diving after that, which is unfortunate. They lost a lot. That's a substantial difference from how I, uh, how I teach open water today and how any open water instructor would teach today. I can't even imagine having my students hold their tank above their head in the pool and try and swim oh, with just, it. Uh, I mean, that's just the way it was. I mean, there was just sure. nothing... Uh, there weren't many standards. In fact, uh, back in those early years, um, there were a couple of training organizations, but a lot of people were either learning on their own or they were getting certified through fire departments. Uh, in fact, at the time, the Cincinnati Fire Department uh, issued certifications. Uh, the Ridge Runner Scuba Club in West Virginia issued their own certifications. The Ohio Council of Skin and Scuba Divers, uh, which was a council of clubs, issued their own certification. So there, was, there were no real standardization within the diving world until much later. Thankfully. Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully. Exactly right. I think the <laughs> only reason we don't have a high statistic of accidents at that point is there wasn't a high percentage of people that did it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And I mean, even then, uh, and that's one of the questions I get asked all the time, you know, how safe is scuba diving? And it's very, very safe. Absolutely. And it, it's interesting. I um, Through some of my classes, I, I was showing some of the statistics from Dan of, who are the most likely to get injured? And, and they all look at that and they say, wait a minute, it's the 50 to 60 year olds. And 
that's, that's amazing. And, and the class asks, why is it the 56-year-olds? And says, because that's the people who dive. <laughs> yeah, in fact, actually, the, uh, the survey was done by something called Scuba Blogspot. Uh, and when they did a survey of the active diving population, uh, two-thirds were people over the age of 40. Absolutely. And they ask, well, why is that? And I said, well, it's, it's that point where kids that are out of the house, the disposable income increases because, thankfully, the kids are out of the house. Right. <laughs> and you and I both being yeah. empty nesters going to yeah. definitely appreciate the, the massive pay increase we received when the kids <laughs> left, left yeah. college, at least. Yeah. Well, you have time on your hands, you've got resources, and you certainly have the interest because now you can do things you weren't able to do before. Absolutely. <laughs> so in preparing for open water classes I, and become, or to become an instructor, what are things you feel like divers should do now to become mentally and physically prepared to take open water classes? Well, I think they need to be fully prepared for where they're going to do the open waters. Um, and uh, that's the one thing that, uh, that I really thought a lot about when classes I was teaching because a lot of the promotional materials or the training materials that we were given showed diving in the Caribbean, and we were not diving in the Caribbean. Uh, we, were di we were diving in quarries. We were diving in rivers. We were diving in gravel pits. And so I wanted to make sure the students really understood exactly what they were going to experience when they did the first open water dives. I told them also about the other opportunities where the water was warmer or the visibility was different or a lot of other things, but I wanted to make sure that when they were in the open water, they were there prepared, fully prepared for the environment they were going to do their open water dives in, so that at the end of that, um, they were not overly stressed, uh, mm -hmm. that they were having a good time, and they came away from that wanting to do more dives in other places. That's a good point, is be prepared for where you're diving, and that's... Definitely something that I like to bring up in my open water classes. Where do you want to go with this? What is your objective? I mean, and it's fine. It, whatever the answer is, that's fine. If, if I, I want to be a vacation diver, I want to go see big, um, see big blue, uh, wonderful ocean water. I want to see pretty, pretty fish. Um, and that's all I'm interested in. I have zero desire to be cold. Yeah. And then there's other ones that, you know, certainly want to go do the fire hole river. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and other things, too. For example, um, when we were doing dives again in Ohio, and you're there and you're wearing a full wetsuit, so you're wearing a hood, boots, and gloves. And so I had students who were wearing gloves in the pool. So all the students were required to wear gloves in the pool because they're going to be wearing gloves in the open water. So I didn't want them to have to wear gloves, which degraded their dexterity mm -hmm. for the first time when they're in the open water. So I want that to be something that doesn't take away from the experience of experiencing the open water. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's something you talk about in one of your, your lectures that I, I just love, and it's called normalcy of deviance. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's yeah. one of my favorite phrases that I use it in, and the funny thing is I've expanded it out to more than just outside of diving. I talk about it with my kids. I talk about it um, in my, uh, my daily career. So talk to us about normalcy of deviance. Yeah, that's actually a term that I hadn't heard until um, I was doing some consulting work for uh, a dive livable board. And, and this dive livable board, one thing that I was evaluating were all the things that had to do with the safety of being on a livable board. And as part of that, during that time period, that's when they had the conception disaster uh, in California, where they had 33 divers and one crew member uh, that died in a fire. And so as part of doing that, I actually listened to the whole four hours of the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation of that accident. And during that investigation and during that presentation they gave, they used the term normalization of deviance. And, and so that term really st struck a chord with me, and I started looking into it a lot more. Um, and and of, of course, it was really initially termed when there were other actions, for example, like with uh, the space shuttle program, when the Challenger disaster, because uh, NASA was aware of the fact that the O-rings didn't necessarily perform very well in cold environments. Um, but they launched, and the launch worked. And they launched again, and the launch worked. And then they launched again, and it didn't work, and people died. And so I really related that to things that I was aware of that were going on in the diving community, where people will take shortcuts, and they were, will take a shortcut which deviates from the standard operating procedure, and the shortcut, for whatever reason, works. And so they continue to do that shortcut because by the fact that it worked, it gave them some emotional or mental reward because it worked. Uh, it either made it easier or quicker for them to do something, and they, they maybe have skipped steps. And so, again, things worked until they don't. And when they don't work, sometimes the uh, results are catastrophic. And there are, if you look at the DAN data, for example, one of the, of the sets of data that I think really explains a lot of this 
is something that talks about the number of dives someone had during the 12 months preceding a fatality. And when you look at that graph, there are two peaks. One peak is in the very beginning, where somebody has less than 20 open water dives. And that can be explained because they don't have a lot of experience, and sometimes they're doing a dive that's beyond their experience level, their qualifications. And then at the far end, there are people who have 300 or more open water dives within the 12 months preceding an accident, but we're still a fatality. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But when you look into it, a lot of it has to do with this normalization of deviance. There are people that have so much experience that they skip the steps that you and I would normally use to be fully prepared for a dive. And they are then normalizing those shortcuts to the point where they become normal operating procedure for them, which deviates from standard operating procedure. And again, when it works, it works. When it doesn't, it's catastrophic. What do you think the, the number one shortcut that causes an accident is in the dive industry? Uh, not doing buddy checks, not doing, not doing equipment checks. So when you look at, when you, in fact, actually one of the seminars that I'm doing for a diving medical symposium in New Jersey next week, um, I'm, the seminar is called uh, Diving Fatalities Lessons Learned. And what I do in that seminar is to deconstruct a fatality, a double fatality where there were two people who were found dead after a relatively shallow, um, the depth was maximum depth 60 feet, and these are people who had a lot of experience. And what they had not done was to do a buddy check. Well, for one thing, they didn't really have buddies. It was just kind of the same ocean buddy system. So they didn't have formalized buddy relationships. They did no pre-dive preparation uh, where they were helping each other and making sure that each other were doing the right things. They didn't do any pre-dive equipment checks, and it turns out that one of the divers had not changed cylinders from an earlier dive. So he made a second dive on a cylinder that had less than a full tank of air and ran out of breathing gas in 45 feet of water. And then the person that came to assist him was a person who did not have an octopus or safe second. They actually had a, an integrated uh, inflator octopus system which that person had never used themselves. And the person who was trying to receive air had never seen one or used one before. And it turns out that in, their, in the pre-dive preparation, no one had checked to see if that inflator system was even connected to the cylinder. So the hoses were, were touching the inflator system, but they weren't connected. So no air was coming out of the cylinder through that combined octopus second, or power inflator. And so ended up with two fatalities. So again, skipping standard procedures. So there are standard procedures and checklists are a great way to make sure you're doing a standard procedure. Uh, and those were even supported by the Rebreather Forum that Dan was a part of, Divers Alert Network was part of, that talked about the efficacy of checklists and how important they are. So a checklist and what I call a, a, a standard pre-dive ritual where you go through the same steps each and every time uh, will prevent some of those things from happening and make sure you have done everything the right way. Wow. So what would you say is the biggest safety concern in the industry is today? Uh, diving with, well, right now there are a couple things. One thing that concerns me are people coming back from COVID. Not the disease itself, but the lack of recent experience coming back from COVID. Because some people have been out of the water for two years, three years, four years. And it doesn't take long for those skills to degrade. And when you think about emergency skills especially, like the exchange of air or jettisoning uh, weights or those kinds of things, um, people don't practice those skills. Even, even without COVID, people don't practice those skills. I mean, when you talk to just about any diver and you say, when was the last time you practiced the exchange of breathing gas? Not underwater necessarily, but even standing on a boat or on the shore. Never have. So the vast majority of people don't practice those skills that are complex psychomotor skills that require recent practice to be used effectively. Uh, they don't practice getting rid of weight. So when was the last time, if you talk to any diver, when was the last time you removed weights in an emergency? Never, or hardly ever. Um, and even when you do, the, when you look at weighting systems now, weighting systems require multiple movements to jettison the weights. So if you have a weight integrated BC, you've got two separate pockets. There's no way to remove both at the same time. Just can't happen. Um, and, and to me, Quick release is where all the weights are gone with one movement. That's quick release. 
Uh, and, and so when you're use weight, using weight integrator, you've got to make sure that they can very quickly and efficiently be removed, especially if you're involved in the exchange of air at the same time. Uh, and, and we'll get into pet peeves of mine now, <laughs> where people will have weights in various places on their equipment that nobody knows about except for them. So they're either using a trim weight pocket that's attached to the strap on the back that they can't get to or can't get rid of, uh, or they have weights uh, attached to straps of various places that you can't see and don't know about. And, and so those are issues that people need to understand that, that you need to make sure that everything works. And everything works because you've practiced those skills recently. And so one of the things I talk about both in the papers that I've written and also in my lectures is rehearsal. So since you don't practice these skills during a dive necessarily, you can at least practice the psychomotor skills on the boat. So there's two types of practice. One is called static rehearsal, and that's where you simply listen to things and watch things and watch videos, which doesn't really help. And then there's uh, dynamic rehearsal, where you're actually doing the motor skills necessary to go through the exchange of air. When I was in Ohio many years ago, we used to call that proper pre-dive procedure. Every student, every diver, on every dive, would have to practice the exchange of air standing on the boat or on the shore before they started the dive. Because that way you're reinforcing that muscle memory and that's recent practice. It's better to actually do it underwater where it involves an ascent, um, but, but still, that's better than nothing. So I think the lack of recent practice, both for coming back to the sport after being away for a while, is a serious concern, plus uh, health, health reasons. So when you, and I, Sorry for going on and on, but so when you look at some of the research, in 2008, Dan, Divers Alert Network, reviewed 1,000 fatalities to find out what the triggering events were. And in 2008, when they did that, the number one triggering event was running out of breathing gas underwater. Uh, that involved 41% uh, of the fatalities, running out of breathing gas underwater. They redid an analysis of other fatalities in 2015. In 2015, the number one triggering event were underlying health issues uh, because people's health is, is a real issue in society today, uh, especially cardiac health. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is that anybody, especially over the age of 45, needs to have a regular physical from someone who understands or is familiar with diving medicine and your life priorities um, and periodic have a cardiac stress test, which I just went through last year myself. Absolutely. I think a lot of people take for granted the density of gas that we're suddenly breathing. At, even at 33 feet, the density of gas is twice. Yeah. Um, and the, the amount of effect that that takes onto us, and I think too many of us um, have static careers. My wife is a uh, great example. She sits at a desk because she's an architect, and she spends 40 hours a week sitting behind a desk. And then we, you know, we're in that society of Netflix and chill, unfortunately. And then they get to that point where they're, they're our age, and... They've spent all this time in a static life and suddenly decide that they're going to go jump off a boat in the Caribbean yeah. where the gas is twice to three times to four times the normal density. That's got to take a tremendous toll. And there are, there are four reasons why, or four things that can precipitate a cardiac event or an arrhythmia that could result in a cardiac event. Uh, one of them is immersion. Nothing we can do about that because we're diving. <laughs> the other is cold. Uh, and another is the work of breathing. And the fourth is stress. So three of the four of those things, we can do something about. Work of breathing, come to a dive store like Idaho Dive Pirates, have your regulator tuned properly. Um, that's something you need to do. Um, cold, you can do something about that by having the proper exposure protection. I mean, you look around the dive store here, there are all kinds of wetsuits and dry suits that people should have that will keep them comfortable. Um, the, the fourth thing is stress. And stress because, again, not having recent experience and your stress when you get back in the water and sometimes are beyond um, your experience level, especially your recent experience, or beyond uh, your training and your qualifications. That's a, a huge thing. So yeah. continue, continued education is definitely oh, something that I, I strongly encourage, and it sounds like you strongly encourage as well. Absolutely. Getting back in the water, if you haven't been in the water, come out to a, 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 dive, a dive store like Idaho Dive Pirates and do a refresher. Just take some time to get in the pool. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's one of the things I've appreciated about this shop, for example, is that they, they take the time to do a pre-game party. Let's get in the water. Let's practice. Let's do a few things. But yeah. it almost sounds like you're, you might be advocating towards having a dive boat and a dive master get up before his crowd of 6 to 12 divers and say, Let, 
okay, who is our buddies? One. Two, how are you going to exchange air? Um, and uh, let's go ahead and this, uh, here's the suggested method of do that. Here's what, for example, SSI standard says. Read through them. Um, familiarize, your, familiarize yourself with your buddy's dive gear. Where are, you, yeah. where are their weights? Yeah. I mean, we unfortunately in our dive community, we all have read the the uh, core report and, and the studies and the articles on the death at McDonald Lake. Yes. That's yes. and it's just it's heartbreaking to say the least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, but they they put weights in odd places and the person trying to save her had no idea to look in the pockets. Yeah. I mean, who would think to look at the pockets? Yeah, and, and chronic overweighting is a real issue. When you look at um, those triggering events that I talked about from those two different studies, one in 2008, one in 2015, uh, the top six, um, buoyancy was one of the issues. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with because people chronically overweight themselves uh, and, and don't know exactly how to get rid of them. Plus, as I mentioned before, having weights and pockets and you know, trim weight pockets and straps and that to me makes no sense. Uh, you want to be able to make sure that you can quickly remove those if you need to and that the people you dive with know how to do that. I remember I was on a liveaboard board a couple of years ago and, and because of weight restrictions flying there, I, I didn't take my own BCD. So what I did was I rented one from the boat. And so during the first uh, hour or so, my buddy and I practiced with the BCDs that we had to see how effectively and efficiently we could remove those, those weight pockets. Um, and after doing that for almost an hour, uh, I made the decision, no, I'm just going to use a weight belt. Uh, because again, to me, I'm more comfortable with a weight belt. One movement, the belt is gone, the weights are gone. And no weights are anywhere else other than on that weight belt or in those pockets. Because I'm aware of situations where people, uh, action reports, where people have removed those weight pockets and they're still negatively buoyant because they have so much weight in the trim weight pockets that are back in the back of their tank that they can't touch. The only challenge I see with weight pockets is, is more humorous than not, is that as we become older like us, um, we gain that, that body build that doesn't hold up a belt <laughs> as easily, whereas when teaching women, they tend to build a better body build that holds away more, more easily. So yeah. that's, that's my only challenge with older divers is we tend to have 50% of the segment that is not designed to hold a belt up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, but now, I mean, when you consider the, the buoyancy issues, and I don't know if you really want to get into this or not, but sure. um, there is a new system that's out there. This system I, I mentioned briefly earlier was the Avello diving system, mm -hmm. where it really reduces the amount of weight you wear. In fact, I was, um, I, I'm, a contract, uh, do contract work, uh, consulting work for that company, looking at the safety aspects of their equipment. And I was asked to test dive it in, in, in Maui. And for one thing, it's 15 pounds lighter than a standard 80. Um, and I was, when I was test diving it, I was wearing a wetsuit in Maui. And normally with that wetsuit, I'll wear about 16 pounds of lead. With that Avello system, I wore four pounds of lead. And I think by the, if had I been there a few days longer, made a few more dives with it, I might have gotten down to zero lead, even with a wetsuit on, because it works like a ballast tank on a submarine. Mm -hmm. And with that system, it does away with the overweighting. Plus, um, there are no rapid and dramatic changes that take place if your equipment fails. So for example, if you're wearing a buoyancy compensator and the power inflator sticks, all of a sudden you have a potential rapid ascent. That can't happen with the Avello system because you're not wearing a buoyancy compensator. You are neutrally buoyant throughout the whole water column. Um, and, and so if, if you, so you can't overweight yourself because you're wearing hardly any weight. Even people that wear dry suits, you were talking about Jennifer Idol. Jennifer Idol wears a dry suit and she was able to take 50% of the weight off of her weight system uh, with the Avello diving system, which is incredible. And I think, to me, that's where the future of the sport is going. Wow. Absolutely. What do you think the biggest challenge we have in our sport is, though, facing the dive industry today? Well, there are a number of things. For one thing, the economy. If you look at the industry itself, um, the industry is the economy because a lot of the dive retailers and dive centers are small businesses. And with the struggling economy, the dive stores are struggling even more. With COVID, uh, COVID was devastating to the diving industry um, and devastating to the sport in some ways because of the fact that there were few of the dive stores that could actually stay open and so therefore Diver didn't have a place to go, and some of the dive, uh, dive boats were not operating. The destinations were not operating because you couldn't either get in there or you had so many restrictions that it was very difficult to get there. So the industry itself suffered from that and is still suffering from that. Uh, the sport itself, 
the problem that the sport itself is having is competition from other sports. So with scuba diving, it's probably more expensive than some other sports. It may be more time consuming to learn how to do it than some other sports. Um, and there are so many people that are distracted by things where you sit in front of your television screen or your computer screen or your, your laptop or your, your handheld device, your, your phone. Um, and, and sometimes people spend more time enjoying those things when they really could be outside enjoying something like scuba diving. And the other challenge the sport has is the negative publicity that people have about the health of the marine environment. So just about every day there's some notice about trash in the ocean or ocean acidification or global warming or climate change or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that people say, well, I've heard that there's nothing to see. Well, that's not true. There are a lot of stuff, a lot of things to see. And like you, I do a lot of diving. I mean, I've been to a lot of places and, and I've seen a lot of great things. I mean, I was in the Cayman Islands last summer and I've been to Tasmania, I've been all, a lot of places. And, and things have changed, but it doesn't mean there's nothing to see. There's still a lot of great things to see. Things just may be a little different. That's absolutely true. What's your, your favorite def, dive, def, dive destination to this point? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's kind of tough. Um, probably the, one of the most exciting dives that I've ever done uh, is in Lake Huron. In fact, there was a, a book that was written a few years ago called uh, 100 Places to Go Before You Die, 100 Places to Dive Before You Die. And I was asked to contribute. And what I contributed was uh, a dive in Lake Huron, a place called Tobermory, Ontario. There is a place there, the Fathom Five uh, National Park, that has a lot of shipwrecks from the 1800s. And, and so you can dive down to wrecks, for example. My favorite was a, a dive on a wreck called the Arabia. The Arabia sank in 1884 in a storm. Uh, it didn't collide with anything. Uh, and so when it sank, it settled to the bottom, and it's upright on the bottom. So it's a, it's a 19th century wooden hull shipwreck sitting upright on the bottom with the ship's wheel still there. Uh, the anchors are still in place, the bowsprit sticking out uh, into the water. And um, you can actually go inside the hull, you could then go inside the hull and reach down to the bottom and pick up corn that was part of the corn cargo in 1884. Uh, absolutely fabulous, absolutely fabulous dive. One of the most exciting dives uh, that I think I've ever done because back in the early years when we started diving it, the, the lakes were not as clear as they are now. So the water would be sort of greenish and you would swim along the bottom and all of a sudden you'd see this silhouette of an 18th, 1800 shipwreck sitting on the bottom of the bowsprit and the anchors and everything. And it was just, I mean, your, your heart would explode with excitement. I mean, it's just fantastic. So I, I love that place. One of the best ocean dives I've ever done was on the island of Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. Kwajalein is a U.S. Army base, and uh, it's very difficult to get to it and get on it. You have to have permission and orders from the U.S. Army to get on the island. So Betty and I actually were uh, doing a tour of the Pacific for some things for Divers Alert Network, and we decided to stop there and, and meet with the dive club that was there. And uh, Kwajalein, again, because it's so remote, it's really pristine diving. And then in the lagoon is a fully intact German battleship. Prinz Eugen. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prince Eugen was captured at the end of World War II, brought to Kwajalein, and then ultimately Bikini for the atomic bomb test. Um, and it's the only ship to survive two atomic bomb blasts. It didn't sink. So they towed it back to Kwajalein to see why, try to figure out why it didn't sink. Got in the lagoon, a storm hit, it rolled over and sank. So it's upside down in the lagoon, fully, completely, absolutely intact. Wow. Fabulous. Fabulous dive. Um, and other places like Tasmania, uh, the Weedy Sea Dragons, uh, Cayman Islands, there was a little Cayman last summer, fabulous wall, Bloody Bay Wall, is absolutely tremendous. Cozumel, I mean, they're just, every place is good. I mean, I've had great dives everywhere. Now, you recently had the opportunity to go to Antarctica. Yep, went to Antarctica. I was actually there for the first time in 2018. And uh, Betty and I went there in 2018. Uh, and I went back in January of this year um, there's an, a company called uh, o, Blue Green Expeditions that's run by a friend of ours named Faith Hortines. And um, I do volunteer work. Betty and I both do volunteer work for her. Uh, and whenever she needs assistance with something, uh, she'll call and say, you know, can you do this for us? That's why I went to Tasmania. I helped her out on a trip to Tasmania. I actually ran a trip for her to Cuba uh, this last year. 
Um, and then we went to the Antarctic in 2018. She asked me to help out on this recent trip in January uh, to the Antarctic. And then we're doing another trip uh, in uh, 2024, which is a citizen science program also to Antarctica. So tell us about a diving Antarctica. That has to be amazing. <laughs> it, it's different. Um, it is, um, well, as you can imagine, exceptionally cold. But it was actually colder here in Idaho than it was in Antarctica. Um, because it was in the Antarctic summer, so that's when sure. we go. And the air temperature was in the 20s, uh, but it's a very stark environment. So there, very rarely do you see the color green anywhere um, because uh, everything is covered with snow and ice. And uh, the water temperature was about 30 degrees most of the time, 30, 31. Uh, visibility was relatively good. Uh, one of the dives, we saw a lot of whale bones on the bottom because there are a lot of whales there. And also, that was a very uh, important whaling area for a long time. Um, we also had a chance to dive on a shipwreck um, called the Governor Norrin. The Governor Norrin was a whaling ship that uh, caught fire in the early 1900s. And in order to save the whale oil and the crew and whatever passengers were on board, they ran it aground. So the bow is actually out of the water, and the stern goes down to about 60 feet. Uh, the wreck itself is covered with uh, yellow and orange uh, encrusting sponges. Uh, there's some anemones down there, so it, it, it's really a pretty good dive. And then on this last trip, we had a chance to go to um, a place called uh, Dis Disappointment Cove and Disappointment Bay, where um, they, there was at one time a whaling station, and it just got so difficult and, and no longer profitable that they finally abandoned it. Um, but it was pretty interesting. We had a chance to, to actually get onto the land itself and there were penguins everywhere, and there were uh, elephant seals, and uh, a lot of other things, plus all the, some of the remains of this whaling station. So it's, a, it's an exciting place to go. I would strongly recommend people go. Um, it is changing, so it's, a, it's, it's a being affected by climate change, like a lot of other places in the world. But supposedly, it's changing more rapidly than any other place in the world. Um, and on this last trip, I unfortunately did see a piece of trash which I had never seen there before. Uh, and I think it actually probably came off a cruise ship or something. It wasn't a bottle or anything. It was a piece of plastic sheeting. So I think it came off of a cruise ship. Because there are a number of cruise ships that go down there. Sure. It's just a hard place to get to because you've got to fly all the way to the tip of South America, to Ushuaia, Argentina. Uh, and then you have to take a ship over to the Antarctic continent, uh, which takes about two days going across the Drake Passage, which can be very challenging. And on, on one of the trips, as a matter of fact, I was giving a lecture and the ship took a 40 degree roll, and I went flying across <laughs> the lounge where I was doing the lecture. Uh, and luckily it wasn't hurt, but uh, it can be very challenging. That's incredible. So uh, drawing on your time at Dan, what do you think the most interesting thing you learned during your time at Dan was? Well, I think the most important thing I learned, and interesting thing I learned, was the commitment that the employees have to the diving industry and the divers themselves. I mean, you, you're not gonna find any more dedicated people anywhere. And when I, when I first went there, my job was to develop training programs. So I created the Dan Oxygen Program and all the other programs that they have uh, in training. And, and the people we had in training were the top people there were in the diving world at the time. And, and when you talk about access, people have access to uh, the medical department. You can call the medical department 24 hours a day, seven days a week, have a diving emergency, and you're instantly talking to probably the most knowledgeable people in the diving world about diving emergencies and diving medicine. And then their commitment to research. I mean, they were doing a lot of research was, which was changing the face of the sport. I mean, flying after diving. Uh, they did experiments in chambers over at the Duke University Medical Center uh, that they had a chamber that can be most also pressurized and also turned into an altitude chamber. So they could simulate flights and then simulate dives. Uh, so they were getting real time data on, on the effects of flying after diving. So that's the reason why they came up with the fly after diving recommendations. Uh, doing research on fatality to figure out why things happen. Doing their annual uh, diving report to give information about statistics, about things that divers are involved in and maybe what the triggering events were that uh, turned a, a dive into a fatality or injury. So all those things are, are really important. And again, I, I think the dedicated people that work there is really, really impressed me a lot. So from your experience understanding this, and you have somebody coming new into the, to the diving industry after their open water class, 
What are some classes that you would suggest that any diver should take to be a better diver or a safer diver? Well, I would take as many classes as you can, because no matter what class you take, you're going to learn something. So after open water, I would certainly take an advanced class. I would certainly take a rescue class. And I would also recommend a nitrox class. Uh, so I would take those four. So your open water class, your advanced, your rescue diver, and, and then the advanced. And then, or excuse me, and then the nitrox. And anything else, any refresher course you can take, any online training program you can take, uh, reading, everything, all those things are important. I mean, there's never, there's never a place where you know everything you can know or should know. Uh, so diving should be one of those things that's a continuous learning process. Uh, and I'm always learning things, new things, and hearing new things and seeing new things that I've never seen before. That's one reason why I tend to be very inquisitive on a dive trip, because I'm asking people about their experiences. I'm asking about their equipment. I'm seeing things that I haven't seen before and learning things. So it's a continuous learning experience. I feel like through this interview, I've had a master class in diving, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't know about that. <laughs> and I've, I've, en I've enjoyed every piece of this, that is for sure. Um, I've got so many questions, but I feel like we've, we've covered so much. Um, just a couple more questions, if you don't mind. No, that's uh, fine. Uh, uh, what do you feel the future of the, uh, the diving industry looks like? Well, I think for one thing, I think it's moving towards uh, more electronics. Uh, so, for example, uh, now we have dive computers that are air integrated. So you can look at your dive computer and see how much air you have. Um, this system I was telling you about, the Avello system, which is much lighter um, I think people are looking for equipment that's lighter, smaller, more compact, uh, easier to use. There is the technical diving community that's uh, starting to use certainly more complex and comp comp excuse me, complicated and sophisticated equipment like rebreathers. Um, and, and I think they'll be eventually going to more the use of head-up displays where you, in fact, there was a head-up display mask that was available from Oceanic at one time. There probably are a few others out there now, but I think they'll be more common where you actually are simply seeing all of your information and data uh, in the lens of your mask to make it a lot easier. Um, so I, I do think, and I do think too, better dry suits. I think anything that makes diving more comfortable, easier to do, more enjoyable is where the industry is heading. Absolutely, and I, I see that. I, I, I technical dive, and, and my specialty and, and my enjoyment is side mount diving. I'm mm -hmm. um, having had some back back issues as well, but I've, mm -hmm. I've seen just in the last five years, the amount of change and growth in just the technical when it comes to side mount diving yeah. has been incredible. Yeah. Um, and it's been wonderful. So I enjoy that thoroughly and, and I feel like side mount is definitely something that's growing in, in the, um, it's no longer just the eclectic dive, dive caver, yeah. the cave diver sport anymore. Now it's, yeah. we just spent uh, 10 days in Hawaii in February and, and uh, I didn't take anything but side mount wave mate. Yeah. I jumped off a boat in single. It, we did bay dives and twin yeah. and enjoyed it thoroughly, absolutely. I and mean, that's one of the things that I'm strongly recommending to older divers is side mounts. Because it's a lot easier. They can put it on in the water. Don't have to climb up the ladder without it on your back. Absolutely. It, it's definitely a, a wonderful idea. So talking about te uh, technical diving, what do you think the big feel that the biggest difference between the recreational side and the technical side is? Well, besides learning, I mean the learning process, uh, there's so much more to learn. And when you talk to technical divers, there's so much or well-informed about some of the more advanced and technical aspects of the sport than open water divers need to be. Um, and, and I think there's, there's some discussion about whether or not technical diving is really recreational diving. In my opinion, it is. I think it's simply a different form of recreational diving. And uh, of course, re recreational diving, you have what are the recommended limits, and nobody knows exactly why those limits are recommended the way they are, uh, but not going deeper than whatever the recommended depth is, 130 feet or so, uh, or going beyond the no decompression limit. So that's that envelope of recreational diving. Technical diving goes beyond that. And in, in my lifetime, in my career, um, we went from recreational diving to something where you're really going beyond the limits. Um, and, and, and there was really no real name for it at that point in time. It was simply going beyond whatever the limits were. And then ultimately it became technical diving. Uh, because we were pushing those limits back in those days by going beyond the limits and using computers to do more advanced decompression, using different techniques to do decompression, using different gas mixtures. Um, and that was really before rebreathers started being very popular. And now they're very popular. And there's it, rebreathers sometimes get bad press, but I think that in some respects is unjustified because it's like anything else. It is technical equipment. It requires proper amount of training and the right use and techniques and checklists and everything else. 
And I think if you use it the way it's supposed to be used, I think rebreathers are as safe as anything else. I, 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 the only concern I have is when people go back and forth between open circuit scuba and rebreather because the techniques are entirely different. You know, you, with an open circuit, you can take the regulator out of your mouth and talk to people on the surface. You can't do that with a rebreather without closing the breathing loop. Um, and so I think you need to make sure that in, when we were doing science diving and using rebreathers, we were dedicated to rebreathers. We use those and use those only. We didn't switch back and forth. So I think if you want to use rebreathers, that's fine. Just make sure you use it properly, follow all the uh, checklist recommendations and all of the safety recommendations, and then it's as safe as anything else. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the biggest things I've gotten from your conver our conversation today. One of the interesting ones is for an instructor, you wanted to make sure that any student you taught was uh, capable of diving with the person you loved the most. Well, that was an interesting thing, and it honestly is something I'm going to add to my open water uh, presentations. Yeah. Um, make sure that you're not shortcutting, that you're going through doing the buddy checks, doing the basic processes, getting the education, and doing the things in the proper order consistently. Use it correctly. Yeah. And I can see that coming from um, an organization like Dan.org and, and Dan or Consulting as well. Absolutely um, I see that point of it. And I feel like we as the dive community shortchange more often than we should. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and one thing, too, I think is important. If, if anybody that watches this or talks to you, if they ever want to talk to me, uh, you can reach me at my email address. I answer questions all the time. So it's danor at danorconsulting.com. And, and I'm, I'm available to answer any question about anything. In fact, I've got a couple of questions waiting in my email box right now uh, that people told me about this morning that uh, I'm helping them get through some questions they need to have answered. That's fantastic, and I, I greatly appreciate your time today. Oh, my pleasure. The last uh, two more things is, finally, can you share a personal anecdote or tips about uh, diving that uh, you've learned over the years? Ah, well, there, I mean, there are a lot of experiences you have, and, and just make sure that, that again, you're, you're qualified. So if, I, if I'm looking to do something, for example, when I was going to go to the Antarctic for the very first time, that concerned me. Um, and, and up at that time, I actually didn't necessarily feel that I was fully prepared for that kind of dive. So for one thing, I came here, talked to Brett. Uh, in fact, Brett loaned me a BCD because the BCD I had uh, was not the right size BCD for the dry suit I was going to be using uh, in the Antarctic. And the dry suit I was going to be using is one I hadn't used before. So what I did, I actually went to Ushuaia, Argentina, our departure point, a few days early and did preparatory dives with all of that equipment before I ever went to the Antarctic. So I'm a firm believer in that. So that really helped me get over the, the concern I had about using new equipment for the first time in a very unforgiving environment like the Antarctic. Uh, and I think that really, for one thing, made me a lot more comfortable and allowed me to enjoy the dives that I did in the Antarctic, even though they were short. <laughs> uh, enjoy those dives a lot more because I was fully prepared for that kind of diving. Absolutely. Dan, thank you so much. My pleasure. I appreciate you. My pleasure entirely. This has been, yeah. I feel like I've, I've had a master class, uh, so I appreciate it and, and uh, enjoy speaking with you and listening to your stories. I'd like to finish off my interviews with three dad jokes. Did you prepare your dad jokes? <laughs> well, I, can, I, can, I have one, maybe two that, uh, offhand. Um, whether you're tall or short, whether you're fat or thin, whether you're old or young, at the end of the day, it's night. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> and do you have one? I do. Why did the kid pursue scuba diving? I don't know. Because he was always below sea level. All right. <laughs> well, and I, I heard uh, about a guy, uh, in fact, a friend of mine went home and his uh, kids were on eBay. Uh, and he said that if they're on eBay tomorrow, I'm going to have to lower the price. <laughs> They are dad jokes. They don't have to be good. No, they no, they're, that's a great one. <laughs> Why did the stingray and the scuba diver have a chat? I don't know. They want to have a manta manta communication. <laughs> well, Betty told me one time she wanted to have uh, peace and quiet while she cooked, so I turned off the smoke alarm. <laughs> and that's a true story. <laughs> that's a true story. <laughs> that makes it even better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll end mine off with, what do you get when you combine a scuba diver and a janitor? <laughs> Jacques
custodian. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very good. Very nice. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, thank <laughs> you very much. My pleasure.